and, uh, and, and to grow in our relationship with him. I want you to turn to the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus. We're going to be in Leviticus tonight and maybe through the week. We'll just see how God leads. Uh, but Leviticus is probably one of those books of the Bible. If I was to ask somebody, what is your favorite book of the Bible? Probably nobody in this room would say Leviticus. Except for Earl. Well, I finally met one. It's shocking to me that Earl... No, it's not. Okay. <clears throat> what a great book of the Bible. You know, uh, the end of last year, I've always said, uh, you know, Dad always taught us, and it is good to have my dad in the service tonight. Um, dad always taught us to read our Bibles. And uh, he didn't tell us, he taught us. So there's a difference. He trained us to read our Bibles. You say, what does that mean? Well, a train is something that you hook on and pull along, right? Train up a child in the way he should go. That means you have to go that way. Amen? Because you can't pull them somewhere you're not going. And Dad trained us to read our Bibles. And, and Dad, uh, to me, he's, well, he's one of the most prolific Bible readers I know. Uh, he... he uh, he reads his Bible. That is his number one thing to do every day. And, uh, and I appreciate that example. And um, so I've always read through my Bible every year, and he reads through it a lot more than once a year. But I read it through once a year. Well, at the uh, end of last year, I just kind of felt like I was in a rut in my Bible reading. And... Um, uh, a rut, you know what a rut is, it's, it's a grave with the ends kicked out. That's all it is, amen. And so <clears throat> I, I was asking the Lord uh, how he wanted me to read his word this coming year. And uh, the Lord didn't speak to me in an audible voice, but I believe he impressed upon my heart to just focus in on 12 books of the Bible this year. And so what I've been doing is I've been taking one book, and for the entire month, I just read and reread that book of the Bible. And um, I won't get through the Bible this year in my Bible reading. I know that that's a cardinal sin to some. But it's not in the Bible that you have to read the Bible through once a year. Okay, I just put that out there. It's not a command. It's a good practice. And if you haven't read your Bible through, you ought to read your Bible through before you try something like this. But... Um, but the Lord impressed on me to read this way, and so in the, book of, uh, in the month of January, I spent the month reading the book of Leviticus. It seems like God directed me to books that I wasn't really well-versed in. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, there's some books of the Bible you think you got a pretty good grasp on, and then there's others that you, that you avoid like the plague because you're scared to death, you don't understand it. Well, Leviticus was one of those second types of books for me. And, um, and I really thought, Brother Frank, I really thought as I read through the book of Leviticus, got ready to start uh, through the book of Leviticus, I thought, you know, by the time January 31st rolls around, I'm going to be so glad to be moving on to the next book. But you know what I found, Brother Troy? I found that when I got to January 31st, I didn't want to stop. I wanted to stay in this book of Leviticus. And I read it through several times. I don't know how many times I read it through. I listened through the book even more times. And I listened to the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing. And it's good to, to listen to the Word of God. It's a lot better than talk radio. Amen. A lot be it's a lot better than tear in my beer. Amen. Y'all are sitting out there like, I don't know what he's talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It's, listen, it's a lot better than all that stuff you listen to on a regular basis. A lot better than CNN. Amen? And Fox News. Throw them all in there. The Bible's better than anything else you can listen to. And so I listen to the Word of God a lot. I like the Word of God to just, to just cleanse me and just cleanse my mind and cleanse my heart. And uh, sometime back I heard a preacher talking about about uh, uh, someone was talking to him about how he uh, uh, just, just felt bad because he couldn't retain all that he was reading and he couldn't retain 
all that he was hearing when he, when he came and heard the word preached. He said, I just feel like I forget so much and I'm not retaining much. And the temptation is to cut back on your amount. You say, well, I'll just get a little bit and that way I can retain what I hear. But you're not, you're not really retaining any more than you would have if you got a bunch. Right? And so uh, this preacher explained it this way, and I like I liked what he said. He said, uh, you ever seen a colander? Not a calendar, a colander. A colander, when I, I remember as a child looking at that, at that colander and thinking that's the most useless thing I've ever seen. A bowl with holes in it. I mean, what's, what's the use of a, of a bowl with holes in it? And uh, I thought, you know, just to throw it away, but I found that it has a purpose. And, you know, you put your vegetables and, and lettuce and stuff, and you wash that stuff, and you pour the water in, and it washes it, it cleanses it. And he said, you know, the Word of God, even though you might feel like you're a bowl with holes, amen, when you're, when you're being filled up with the Word of God, just the fact that the Bible is passing through your ears and your mind and your heart, it's cleaning you up. Wherewithal shall a man uh, cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. If you're not reading the Bible, you are, listen, you think I'm about to berate you. I'm not berating you, but I'm telling you, you're missing out on so much truth and so much blessing, so much help. Well, I can't remember everything I read. You don't have to remember everything you read. Just open the Word of God and read God's Word and let it cleanse you and let it, let it fill you and let it wash you. Some of it's going to stick. Amen? Some of it's going to stay in there. But you know what? You're not going to have any of God's Word in your mind and heart if you're not reading it. Amen? Some people, their Bible reading is a calendar. I talked about a calendar earlier. They get their verse of the day. One verse. One verse. You know what you never find on those calendars, the one verse calendar? You never see, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. I've never seen that on a calendar, have you? But we need to read that. We need to be reminded of that. Amen. Listen, the Bible's a big book. God's got a lot to say, and we need every word of it. Now, so, it is all profitable, even the book of Levit Leviticus. So I'm not a Jew. I'm not a Jew either. But guess what? I can still profit from this book because the Bible says all Scripture. You know what Scripture is? You say it's the Word of God. It's the written Word of God. That's what Scripture is. Script. God has written His Word. He's had His Word written down. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. We can profit from any part of Scripture. And so, with the Lord's help, let's, let's uh, uh, profit from the book of Leviticus tonight, okay? Leviticus chapter 1, and if you haven't found it by now, you're not going to find it, so we'll just move ahead. Leviticus chapter 1, and uh, verse number one, and I would invite you to stand. If you're able, stand with me. Uh, if you have been busy, most of you have been busy today, that means you're tired. And so stand up, get the blood flowing, amen, so you don't fall asleep in the first five minutes, amen. Just see how much we can get in here before you nod off. Leviticus chapter 1, look at verse number 1, and we'll read down through verse 9. Leviticus 1, verse 1, the Bible says, And the Lord called unto Moses... And spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will, at the door of the, uh, of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. And he shall kill the bullock before the Lord. And the priests, Aaron's, Aaron's sons, 
shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into his pieces. And the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire. And the priests, Aaron's sons, shall lay the parts, the head and the fat, uh, in order upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar. But his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar. To be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. I want to just kind of lay a foundation about the book of Leviticus tonight and maybe get some truths that will help us in our lives. So let's pray and ask God to speak to our hearts. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing of life. Lord, you've been so good to us. By you we move and breathe and have our being. And God, we want to recognize your goodness upon us. Lord, we want to pray tonight that you would meet with us again, that you would speak to us from your holy, precious word. God, uh, the songwriter said, all is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One comes down. God, we are asking as we, as we preached and prayed yesterday, we are asking that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down, that you would stir our hearts. Lord, that you would draw us near to yourself. Lord, that we would truly have fellowship with you, that your spirit would fill us and enable us to live for you and to shine in a dark world until you come back for us. We need revival. And Lord, though we may look at this passage and think, what like, uh, does this possibly have to do revi with revival? We understand, Lord, that your word is quick and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, it can get right down to the need of our hearts. It can divide between the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. God, I pray that you would use this book tonight, your word, to speak to our hearts, to cut away that which is uh, uh, not pleasing in your sight. Lord, I pray that you would revive us by your spirit. Fill us, Lord, with your goodness and your power. Lord, I pray you'd save the lost. And Lord, I pray that you'd revive the saints. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. <clears throat> In Leviticus chapter 1, we understand the book of Leviticus is written specifically to the tribe of Levi, really to all the nation, but about the tribe of Levi and about the service that God had called them to. The Levites had been called by God to serve as the priests uh, of the Lord. And uh, there's, there's really three primary divisions in the book of Leviticus, three topics that the Lord deals with. He deals with the offerings, and uh, we see that right out of the gate. He deals with the offerings and those things that, uh, uh, those laws regarding the offerings. And then he deals with uh, just a, uh, really a, a, a myriad of other laws regarding their lives within the, the land of promise that he was leading them into. And then uh, he deals with the priesthood. And so when you, when you read the book of Leviticus, you have these three components that kind of uh, intertwine throughout the book. And uh, it's God's instructions uh, for the Levites, uh, how the sacrifices were to be brought, what sacrifices were to be offered for different sins and different things uh, regarding uh, their, their relationship with God. And, uh, and, and so uh, God is... Uh, They've just finished the tabernacle. When you get to Leviticus chapter 1, they've just finished putting together the tabernacle. And in, in verse 1 of chapter 1, look at it again. It says, And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation. So what this means is that God is inside of the tabernacle and Moses is outside of the tabernacle. So, so that's how the book of Leviticus begins. And, and really, the book of Leviticus is primarily God speaking to Moses to speak to the people. And so most of the book of Leviticus takes place in this setting. God's in the tabernacle, and the rest of them are outside the tabernacle. They say, why is that? Well, if you look at chapter 40 of Exodus, look with me 
just right across the page, or maybe it's one page back for you, Exodus chapter 40. When we, uh, when we finish the book of Exodus, we're seeing that the tabernacle is being finished, it's being put together. And um, if, if you look at chapter 40 and verse number 16, it said, Thus did Moses, according to all that the Lord commanded him, so did he. And in chapter 39 of Exodus, verse 42, we get the context of what he's talking about. According to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel made all the work. The work of what? Well, the work of the tabernacle. Look at chapter 40, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month uh, shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. And then he goes down through there, giving them all the instructions, where to put the ark, where to put all the, the pieces, all the furniture, uh, how to set it up, and all of this thing. And so in verse 16, it says that Moses finished it. And he did it exactly the way that God told him to do it. Now, in verse number 33 of chapter 40, look what it says. He reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate, so Moses finished the work. Then, now then is a very important word in the Bible. And my dad went through in his Bible reading and he underlined all the thens. Is that correct? 2,488 times we have the word then in the Bible. Then, and we didn't rehearse this. He didn't even know what I was preaching on tonight. But he just got it in there. Amen. Then, the Bible says, Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation, because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So this is why God's on the inside and Moses is on the outside. They finished all the work. God gave them the instructions. They finished it all together. And when they finished it, then God filled it. Just as he had promised that he would do, if they would follow his directions, he would fill that tabernacle with his presence. Now, why, why the tabernacle and, and why, listen, the, the tabernacle, the purpose of the tabernacle is so that God could dwell with men. Because it is the chief goal of God to fellowship with us. People say, why did God create man? And some will say, well, he created them so he could save them. Well, I'm glad he saves us, amen? But that's not why he created us. Well, he created us so he could, he could uh, show his power. And, and thank God, his power is seen even in our frame, amen, and in all creation. But that's not why we were created. He created us, the Bible says, for his pleasure. And you want to see the purpose of what God created us for, as I said yesterday, look in the Garden of Eden. He created Adam and Eve to walk with him and to fellowship with him, to hear his voice and to spend time together. And so God created us for that, but because of our sin, our iniquities, the Bible says, have separated us between us and our God. And sin has brought a separation, and because of that, God uh, has, has had to find another way to fellowship with man. For the children of Israel, the whole purpose of the tabernacle was so that God could dwell among them. The purpose of the offerings, the purpose of the priesthood, the purpose of the laws is so that God could dwell among them. Now, why couldn't he just dwell among them the way they are? Because they are unholy. The holiness of God is the central theme throughout the book of Leviticus. It's mentioned well over 80 times, uh, the word holy. And five times in the book of Leviticus, God tells us, be ye holy, or tells them, in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, the Israelites, he tells them, be ye holy, for I am holy. Five times. Starting in chapter 11, we'll probably look at it a little bit later in the week. 
But this is, you say, well, that, that was for them. Well, if you go to the book of Peter, the epistles of Peter, he repeats that to us as believers. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Can I stop and say this? God still expects His people to live holy. Holiness is not outdated. Holiness was not done away by the cross. Not at all. As a matter of fact, the cross of Calvary gives us the ability to live a holy life. You know what the law did? The law said, here's the standard. And mankind tried to reach that standard, and they came short. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God gave that law to show man just how unholy he is. And so don't think that because we're in the age of grace that God doesn't think holiness is important. As a matter of fact, listen, that's why Christ died on the cross, to make us holy. Because God, as a holy God, cannot dwell with unholy man. We see that here. God's inside, everybody else is outside. Why? He's holy and they're not. Now watch what takes place here. If you, if you look at this, I want you to consider some things here, and, and really it's going to give us an idea about this book of Leviticus and the purpose of this book of Leviticus. God's on the inside, and everyone else is on the outside. Now I want you to think about this. Even Moses is on the outside. Even Moses, the man of God, Let's take a little time and look at Moses. Look at Numbers. Look at Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. I believe Pastor referenced Moses right before we came up. How God uh, called him into the ministry when he's 80 years old. Amen? Moses had a remarkable life. He lived to be 120. And his life is broken up in 40-year divisions. And it's quite amazing, his best years were from 80 to 120. His best years. Amen? So listen, those of us getting a little gray on top, white on top, none on top, four more years, Dad's going to hit 80. He's going he's gonna to hit, hit his stride in four years. Amen? And so don't ever count God out. Moses was a remarkable man to me, maybe outside of David, maybe the greatest leader Israel ever had. Look in Numbers chapter 12. Look at verse number 3. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Now I've heard meekness described as power under control. That's a good description of meekness. Uh, uh, listen, Moses had a lot of power, and he had a lot of power with God, and many times he could have promoted himself at the expense of the people. He never did that. As a matter of fact, he took the blame for the people many times. He was meek. He was a good man. And, uh, and, and, and yet God said, you can't come in here with me. Look, look at Exodus 33. Look at Exodus chapter 33. And look at verse number 11. Look at verse 11. Exodus 33, verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. Wow. You want to talk about someone who knew God? Moses knew God. God spoke to him face to face as a man speaketh with his friend. And yet, listen, this is before, before he gets in, uh, be, before the whole tabernacle scenario. 
before the tabernacle's finished. Moses is already that close to God, and yet Moses still is not allowed in the tabernacle. You know why? Because it doesn't matter how good you are in comparison to other people. You're still not good enough to fellowship with God. Not on your own. Now listen, we've got Moses, we've, we've, got, we've got the people obeying. We mentioned and read the verses there in Exodus where they did everything exactly with the tabernacle, exactly the way that God said to do it. And yet, they're still not allowed in. We, we've got the, look, look back in chapter 40 of Exodus again, and watch what, what takes place before they finish the tabernacle. Look in verse number, um, look at verse number 31. Exodus 40, verse 31. And Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet thereat when they went into the tent of the congregation and when they came near unto the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses. You know what they're doing? They're doing everything the way that the law says to do it. They are, they are trying to cleanse themselves and wash themselves and make themselves presentable unto God, and they're still not acceptable. You know why that is? Because it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Nobody's going to be in heaven be, uh, by their good works. I don't care what, what age they were born in, before the law, during the law, after the law, tribulation, nobody gets to heaven by their works. By the grace of God. Someone has to intervene. Now listen, you say, well, it's the priest. Well, of course, Moses can't go in because he's not the priest, even though Moses was a Levite. Well, it's got to be the priest. Well, look, in, uh, look, look with me in chapter number 16 of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16. And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of, his two, uh, of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died. Now you read the story in Leviticus 10. His two sons, Nadab and Abihu, I believe were their names, they went in to offer to the Lord, but they offered strange fire before God, and God killed them. He sent fire from heaven and killed them. Now, they're religious people. As far as I can tell, they wanted to be in the service of God. If they hadn't have been, they wouldn't have been in the temple to begin with, or the tabernacle to begin with. You know, it's possible to be sincerely wrong. I, you know, listen, be careful. You hear people say, well, you know, I know they're a little off, but they're sincere. Sincere doesn't get you into heaven. You got to come God's way. And there's only one way. He says, even these priests, these sons of Aaron, they go in, and they go in unworthily, or they offer unworthily, they die. Look at verse 13 of chapter 16. He's describing when the high priest goes in. He said, he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony, that he die not. That's the high priest. 
That's the one that God has chosen to go in for the people and offer the sacrifice to God. He said, listen, you're going to have to put something on that altar of incense. You're going to have to put some incense there upon that altar of incense and let it burn and let it create like a cloud, a smoke, a covering to go between them and God so God doesn't look down upon them and see that unholy man standing in a holy place before a holy God. There's got to be a covering. Even the high priest would die in there. Why? Because it does not matter what we attain in this life or what religion, that you know, how religious we become, how much we know about God. Listen, you are unholy in and of yourself. Well, I'm not as bad as this guy. Well, that, that's, not, that's not good enough. So when they went in, God, it was God's mercy. We think, we, we think when, God, when God filled that tabernacle and kicked them out, we kind of think it was mean. Well, why'd, he, why'd he put them out? He put them out to save them, to spare them in his mercy and in his grace. He said, no, you, you better just stay out. They needed something else to get in. God's on the inside, they're on the outside. Listen, this is not God's intention. The reason why God gave the tabernacle is so that he could dwell with them, so he could fellowship with them. But there's a problem. He's holy, they're unholy. He's on the inside, they're on the outside. So what does it take to get in? Well, we, we're, we're in chapter 16, and we see this cloud that covers them. But I want to look back in verse number 11. Aaron shall bring the bullock for the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. Then we read verse 13. He's got to put the incense on the fire. Create that cloud of incense to cover him. Look at verse 14. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place, because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. This is what is known as the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is when their sins would be, would be covered, would be paid for, so that God would not destroy them. And when he went into that place, that place that was made to fellowship uh, with God in, he could not go in without blood. He had to go in with that blood, and he had to offer that blood, first of all, for himself. Because before he could offer for the people, he had to offer for himself to cover his uncleanness. And then he had to do it for his household, and then he did it for the people. And notice that when the blood of atonement was offered, it was also to cleanse the tabernacle. Did you see that when we were reading it? Why did the tabernacle need to be cleansed? Because man was in there. And everything that man touches is defiled. Unless 
There's the blood applied to cleanse the sins of the people and cleanse the defilement of the temple. That blood makes it possible for man to meet with God. So we got a bloody religion. Thank God for the blood. Without the blood, there is no remission of sins. Now when he goes in there with that blood, something changes. In Leviticus chapter 1 verse 1, it says that the Lord spake, he called actually, he called unto Moses from out of the tabernacle. God's in the tabernacle, Moses is outside of the tabernacle. Look at Numbers chapter 1 with me if you will. Numbers chapter 1. Go all the way through the book of Leviticus, Numbers chapter 1, look at verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, what's that next word? In the tabernacle of the congregation. When Leviticus begins, God's on the inside, and Moses and the children of Israel are on the outside. But when the book of Leviticus ends, God's on the inside and Moses is on the inside. Leviticus shows us the way in. It shows us how to have fellowship with God. And listen, not just in salvation. Salvation is the beginning. There are five offerings that are mentioned in the book of Leviticus. And we're going to look at those tomorrow night. But listen, it's not just about salvation. Think about, think, think about this. They were saved from Egypt before they ever had the tabernacle. Is that right? They were redeemed. So if, if the tabernacle was just about salvation... Th- Why did he even put it there? They're already delivered. They're already redeemed. No, the tabernacle is about fellowship. So many believers, they think, well, I just, I got saved. I'm good to go. I'm set. I'm all set. They like that up here. They like using that that phrase. I'm all set. You know what? God didn't save you to take you to heaven. That's just a benefit. He saved you to fellowship with you. He saved you to walk with you. He saved you so that you would know his heart and he could know your heart so that you could dwell in communion and fellowship and intimacy, closeness to God. You know what came out of of Egypt? along with the Israelites, the mixed multitude. You know what the mixed multitude spent their time doing? Grumbling, complaining, and wanting to go back to Egypt. And you know what it did? It influenced the rest of them. I try not, I try not to get in the flesh. I don't think it's in the flesh. Because the desire of my heart is not fleshly. But I have a righteous indignation burning in my bones for this new brand of so-called Christianity. That the only thing that matters is I'm saved. And then somehow we think that God should be pleased with us just because we took salvation. Listen, God created us for so much more. So much more. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there 
none other has ever known. That's why I made you. Let me tell you something tonight. You're wondering, I'm saved. How come I'm miserable? Why am I miserable if I'm saved? God built us. Is that right? We've been created by him. That means he put all the pieces of us together. And he wired us for fellowship. You see it all through nature. You see it in the animals. You see it in humans. Listen, there's just something in us that wants to be around other people. Now maybe we only have a small group of people we want to be around. But it's very, very strange and very odd for a person not to be, to not want to be around anyone else. Something is broken. God didn't create us for that. And as much, listen, as much as we want to have fellowship with one another, that's not even what God created us for. He created us to have fellowship with Him. And the reason why people are miserable, even though they're saved, is because they are not living for Him. They're living for self. And they think, if I can get this, if I can have that, if I can, if I can, get, if I can surround myself with the people I like and the stuff that I like, then I'll be happy. And it never works. They're still miserable. Come on. The, the, the group of people that has more than, than probably any other... You look, at, you look at the Hollywood actors and actresses and, and the big money out there in California and the big money. They're all miserable. They're all on drugs, drinking themselves out of their minds, jumping from one relationship to another. They have no peace. They have no joy. Why is it? And, and we look at it and say, well, how can that be? They've got everything they want. Yeah, but they're not living for what God made them for. You will never be satisfied until you're walking with God. Why? Because it's built in you. It's built in you to walk with God. That's what he desires more than anything else. He desires to have fellowship with you. You say, I'm not important. You are to him. You are to him. Listen, you kids. Listen, you kids, look up here. You know what? God wants to talk to you. And he wants you to talk to him. He wants to fellowship with you. The Christian life is not a, a grown-up thing. It's an everybody thing. I remember years ago, I'll tell you this, and maybe I'll be done. I don't know. We'll see. Years ago, we're in a church. I've probably told this story here before. It's hard for me to remember what I've said here and what I haven't. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. He wanted me to sit beside him. Okay. Years ago... It, it fits with my illustration, so that's good. We're on the right track. Years ago, we had a missionary at our church, an uh, older missionary. And he had trouble walking. He had to have braces. and He got done preaching. He came down. He sat right over here on this side, right on the front row. And I went over and talked to him afterwards. And... Uh, he said, he said, Mark, I, he said, I want you to gather all the kids and bring them to me. And I thought, well, he wants to pray over these kids. And so I gathered them all around. They all sat around. They all stood around, all little ones. A bunch of mine were little then. And he sat right, he sat right over here. All these kids sat, gathered around him, and I kind of stood back. I thought he was getting ready to pray for them. And this is what he said. He said, all you kids, he said, I want your attention. They all looked at him. And he said this, would you pray for me? 
Would you pray for me? That's what he asked them to do. And of course they all said, yes, sir, we'll pray for you. And they prayed. And they went back playing. And I asked him, I said, I said, preacher, I said, why? I said, honestly, I'll just be honest. I thought you were going to pray for them when I gathered them all. Brought them to. I thought you were going to pray for them. Why did you ask them to pray for you? He said this, and I've never forgotten it. He said, kids get prayers answered. He said, I'll tell you why. They got less junk in their lives. Kids are good at faith. They're real good at faith. We kind of grow out of it, don't we? We get cynical. Kids are good at faith. The kids have a pure heart. And he said, listen, he said, I've been doing this all these years. I get these kids to pray for me. It's what's keeping me going. You kids, listen. Listen up. Juju, listen up here. God wants to hear you pray. He cares about your voice. He does. He wants to fellowship with you, Ezra. He wants you to know him. He wants to fellowship with you. He wants to hear how your day's going. He wants to hear what makes you afraid. He wants to bear that burden for you. He does. He's not just the God of the grown-ups. He's your God. He cares about you. He wants to hear your voice. See, we, we kind of make it about doing stuff. That's what we make it about. Going to church, tithing, singing, preaching, serving. And we get it backwards. We do all that stuff in order to have fellowship with God. And we've got it backwards. Our fellowship with God should be the engine that drives our service to God. But see, people don't, other people don't see our walk with God. And so therefore, it becomes less important. Because at the end of the day, many times, we are more worried about what other people think and see than what God does. You know what the Lord wants to do? He wants to fellowship with us. It's hard to quantify what that means, isn't it? Just think about the relationships in your life. If you're married, husband and wife, you know when there's fellowship and you know when there's not. Brothers, sisters, you know when there's fellowship and you know when there's not. Parents, children. You know what, God? God gives us those relationships to help us with this relationship. And this relationship will certainly help us with all these relationships. God is holy. God's got that tabernacle. And he says, the reason why I've got it here is because there's a group of people. I want them to know me. And I want them to love me. And I want them to serve me. But there's a process. Listen. You can't just come to God any way that you want to come to God. 
He's not just going to accept anything that you offer. That's another issue I have with the modern church. They feel like anything we offer to God, He ought to be thankful for. I read in the Bible, God's real picky. He is. You read through Leviticus? Oh, man. I mean, he's got it right down. When you offer that offering, this part is mine, that part is mine, that part is yours. I mean, listen, right down to the nitty-gritty. We don't come to God any way we want to. We come to him his way. He made us. He sets the rules. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you're here tonight, you're not saved, you've got to come through Jesus. And listen, if you're out of fellowship with God, you've got to come through Jesus. He is our peace. He is our mediator. He is the one who goes for us to the Father. He is the key to fellowship. You want to know God? Get to know Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Maybe a little different tonight. Lord, I believe with all my heart you've spoken to us. Lord, I, I am I'm I'm tired of dead religion. I'm tired of a form of godliness. We need the power of godliness. And Lord, we know that only comes through you. There's no shortcuts in the Christian life. There's no shortcuts to fellowship with you. We've got to come your way. We thank you that Jesus Christ has made a way for us to enter into the holy of holies. Tonight, how he made a way with his, the veil of his flesh was rent. Just like the veil in that temple was rent when he died on that cross, he opened up a new and living way. Lord, you, you desire to speak to us. You desire to comfort us. You desire to strengthen us. You desire to put joy in us. God, so many times we've blocked you out. We're too busy to walk with you. We're too caught up on outward things to really fellowship with you. Just as Moses sought for that way in to that place of communion, Lord, I pray that our desire would be to get in that holy place with you, to really hear your voice, to know your heart. The sweet psalmist of Israel, David, certainly not a flawless man, but you said he was a man after your own heart. Fashioned after your heart, no doubt, but also in pursuit of your heart. And God, may that be our heart's desire. So easy to get caught up with the outward things. Lord, you're calling us. Just as you called to Moses out of that tabernacle, you are calling to us. You want us to come to where you are. 